Hey guys, welcome back to Cougar Chem Tutoring. I'm Austin. I'll be running through part one of problem set 16, molecular orbital theory. Okay, so in the last problem set, we learned a lot about valence bond theory, which has a lot to do with atomic orbitals. So I'm going to put valence B theory, valence bond theory. Okay, that had to do with atomic orbitals, where here we're going to be talking about molecular orbitals. And we'll talk about the differences here in a second. But remember, atomic orbitals were where we had, let's say a carbon here was binding to another carbon. Let's say it was triple bound to a carbon. Okay, we're going to use this structure here. I could assume that this, this carbon had its own atomic orbital. So it hybridized into, in this case, it would be an SP hybridized. It was bonding with this S orbital from hydrogen. And then it was uh, overlapping orbitals with this other oxygen's SP hybridized orbitals, right? And we, what we were saying is that these each of these orbitals belonged to another um, atom. And that, that the overlap with another orbital from another atom was what created either sigma bond or if they were P orbitals, right? Um, they would be pi bonds, right? Now, um, we're, we're still using sigma and pi designations in molecular orbital theory. Molecular orbital theory, the only difference is that in molecular orbital theory, we're talking about a pi orbital or a sigma orbital as opposed to a sigma bond or a pi bond. Now, in reality, they kind of work in the same way because they're bonding orbitals, um, so they function as a bond, but they're not actually, we don't consider them, you know, a bond in the same way we did in valence bond theory, okay? So in this case, what instead of what uh, what we're doing is we're actually mixing orbitals, and you can only mix of the same type. So, um, if if this carbon if this carbon has an s orbital, right, which is spherical, which e each of these does, right, then the other s orbital from a carbon will mix with the other one. So they're going to mix together, and they actually form. Uh, I'll show you here. They, they if this is an s orbital and this is an s orbital, they form two other orbitals. This one up here, which is the anti-bonding orbital, is what we call it, and down here in lower energy is the bonding orbital. So this is actually an energy diagram because um, this here in higher energy. When you have more nodes, you're technically in higher energy, and the anti-bonding orbital is in higher energy uh, all, all the time. Okay, so um, we do this because it actually is favorable energetically. If we can just put electrons in the lower energy and create an, a, an, a bonding orbital, and then put uh, an empty anti-bonding orbital in higher energy, then it actually increases the strength of our bond. Um, however, if you put electrons into these antibonding orbitals, they do break the bonding orbitals. And so there, there ends up being no bond uh, at all in the, in the compound. Okay, and this can actually happen with P orbitals as well. Sigma bonds can happen with P orbitals. Notice that these sigma bonds, just like uh, sigma bonding orbitals, just like in actual sigma bonds, they're kind of on this internuclear axis. Let me see if I can show you a little bit better in this internuclear axis area, right, between the two nuclei. Um, however, um, uh, in bonding orbitals, they kind of surround the whole thing kind of like a big sandwich. Okay, so it's like a big bun that actually surrounds the whole thing instead of just on the internuclear axis. And so it becomes its own type of orbital. Now these kind of, these sigma orbitals can actually be made with two p orbitals as well, as long as the lobes uh, are aligned on the same axis um, towards each other. So when I add these two together, I actually get um, a two, this would be in, in this case, a two p uh, sigma bonding orbital. So it'll look like this, where you have the two nuclei here in the middle. And this would be another type of sigma bond, but bo sigma bonding orbital um, that we would end up uh, creating. So um, another type is a pi orbital. Uh, and like, like in valence bond theory, they're made with um, p orbitals, okay, above and below the internuclear axis, and they actually create these sandwich looking things. The nuclei are actually right here in the middle. Notice how they're not, these these lobes are not in, on the internuclear axis. Again, kind of like what we saw in valence bond theory, they just look a little different. And that these are actual bonding orbitals that surround the whole thing as opposed to just um, atomic orbitals overlapping above and below. So um, you'll actually need to know um, how to draw these as well, and we'll go through those as we um, go through this problem set. But just this is just kind of an introduction to what um, molecular orbital theory is about. Um, always know too that the higher energy or level orbital will you know always have this ex one extra node than its bonding or orbital counterpart. Okay. So um, in number two, it's asking us for the um, configuration of a particular molecule, and it kind of gives us something that we saw in electron configuration, right? It kind of tells us how many electrons are in each type of orbital, or in, in, in earlier we would talk about them in terms of subshells, right, or shells. But in this case, we're actually talking about them in terms of bonding or anti-bonding orbitals and which type. So um, in order to calculate a bond order in molecular orbital theory, all you have to do is take the electrons in bonding uh, uh, orbitals minus anti the uh, a number of electrons in anti-bonding orbitals and divide that number by two, okay? So um, you'll always know the difference between a bonding and an anti-bonding because an anti-bonding will have this little asterisk, uh, asterisk at the top, okay? So all I have to do is add up 
um, the non asterisk and then subtract the asterisk. So I'm going to say two plus four plus uh, two. So that's a total of eight. So it's going to be eight minus, and then I've got two plus three. So that's going to be minus five over two. That's going to be two point, or sorry, not 2.5. That's going to be um, 1.5, right? Um, and notice that this is a this is not you know just a straightforward um, bond order. It's not like one, two, or three. We can't just say this is going to be a, a single bond or a double bond. Um, and so what ends up happening is this is ends up being more accurate in determining bond order than valence bond theory. Valence bond theory, remember, we could only say like, oh, there's you know two pi bonds, so there must this must be a triple bond, or there's uh, a sigma bond and a pi bond, so there must be this must be a double bond. But we never actually said anything like, oh, there's this may be a one and a half or a two and a half bond order. So that's a big difference is where here we can actually get fractional bond orders and be accurate about it. And and that actually makes um, molecular orbital theory a, a superior to valence bond theory. And, and actually we'll find out other ways that it's able to do that as well. So um, in molecular orbital theory, there are two terms that we use a lot um, to, and, and we use them because these, these areas, the, the HOMO and the LUMO, are where a lot of reactions will happen. Um, electron movement from the HOMO to the LUMO or vice versa will actually determine how some reactions happen, and, and you'll learn a lot more about this in organic chemistry. Um, but um, high, HOMO just means highest occupied molecular orbital. So I'll just put highest occupied molecular orbital. I'll just put MO since we know what molecular orbital is. And then uh, LU, that LUMO, LUMO is just lowest, lowest unoccupied. Okay, so in this case, um, our highest occupied molecular orbital, um, let me go ahead and erase these markings so you can kind of tell what's going on. So the highest occupied molecular orbital would be this guy right there, right? Uh, up until this point, I don't have, I, I, th this is the last area I have electrons in. So that's the highest occupied molecular orbital. So I'm going to say HOMO is pi 2p star, okay? That's my HOMO, and so my LUMO will then be the next guy here. It's just right above it, okay? It's gonna be sigma 2p star, okay? And so that's, um, that's, that's how we'll figure out what the home on the luma are. So it's really not too complicated, but knowing what they are and where electrons are moving will actually help you a lot in later chemistry. Okay, letter C says, is the molecule paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Okay, so now we're kind of going back to a little bit of old concepts. Remember, um, to be paramagnetic, we had to have an, somewhere an unpaired electron, right? And to be diamagnetic, they had to all be paired. Notice that we have an odd number in the top here. We don't even need to draw this out. Just knowing that there's an odd number actually tells us that there's an unpaired electron somewhere. And so we're going to say this is paramagnetic. I'll just put para, okay? So um, that's another thing that molecular orbital theory does that, that valence bond theory can't. It actually determines magnetism. And you'll see this. I don't know if your professor will show you this, but there's a demo where the uh, oxygen gas and nitrogen nitrogen gas are both poured um, in their liquid form over a magnet, and only the oxygen will stay there. And that doesn't make in any sense in any other theory except for molecular orbital theory. So we have a lot of evidence for molecular orbital theory, and in a lot of ways, um, we actually can't use it a ton. Because well, we we can, but it actually requires sometimes a supercomputer to produce some of the data that we need to understand this stuff. So. Um, pr pretty cool stuff, but can be can get really complicated really fast. Um, with MO diagrams, these things, you'll never have to draw them for yourself. Um, <coughs> you can learn patterns, but um, they're in for the sake of Chem 105, they'll always be given to you, and all you have to do is fill them out based off of things that you should already know how to do. So here they're saying the MO energy level diagram for nitric oxide is as follows. All you'll have to do is say, um, how many valence electrons are in this compound? Um, nitrogen, I know, has five, and oxygen has six, so there's a total of 11. So what you do is you fill this in, following Hund's rule. So you're going to go one, two, instead of counting, uh, instead of pairing up first. So so we got two, four, six, eight, um, 10, and then 11, okay? So we filled in the diagram. Now they have they want us to write the molecular orbital configuration of NO. So I just have to look at this and be like, okay, so I've got pi, 2s, and there's two in there. Um, pi star 2s, and there's two in there as well. And then we've got pi 2p, and there's four in there. And then we've got sigma 2p, 
and there's two in there. And then we ultimately we've got a pi star 2p and there's one in there. And we do have to include all of them even if there's none in there because we have to be able to identify the lumo and the homo from all of these. So uh, we got this uh, and then there's zero in there, okay? So now they're gonna ask for the bond order. Remember bond order is, I'm just gonna put bonding B minus A, which is bonding minus antibonding over two. So that means I've got two, uh, four, six, eight minus uh, two, three. So that's going to be eight minus three over two. That's going to be 2.5 bond order. Okay. Um, and so, uh, notice that it, that has to do with the fact that we have an odd number of valence electrons as well. So now the homo, the homo is going to be the highest unoccupied. So that's going to be pi star two P. Okay. And then lumo is going to be the pi star or sigma star, sorry, two P. Um, because it's unoccupied. So there's our two. Now they're going to ask us whether it's paramagnetic or diamagnetic. It is paramagnetic, right? Because we've got one unpaired electron in there. So now ultimately they're going to ask us, is the MO description more useful than the VB description, valence bond theory description? Why or why not? Well, yes, um, we the valence bond theory, okay, it doesn't handle unpaired electrons very well. So uh, cannot, un, I'll just put cannot understand um, unpaired electrons, okay? It doesn't really tell us anything um, useful when we have unpaired electrons. Um, and it doesn't include the concepts uh, of antibonding orbitals to explain. Um, so I'll just put, say, cannot say um, why um, antibonding orbitals can either uh, increase or decrease the bonding order. So, uh, or I'll just put antibonding orbitals effects on bond order effects on bonder. So um, really, uh, valence bond theory, it, it, it can actually kind of give us a good picture because in our minds, we're able to draw valence bond theory um, uh, or valence or atomic orbitals a lot easier than molecular orbitals, especially when the molecules get really big, okay? So um, ultimately, this is, this is kind of what your answer would be for this molecular orbital diagram. And then the a typical MO question would uh, would be would look like this. It would have all these parts saying, you know, what's the bond order? What's the homo? What's the lumo? Is it paramagnetic or diamagnetic? That sort of stuff. Um, all right, I'll see you uh, in part two where we'll go over more examples of this in the in the rest of the problem set.